So Dave, how are, how are you? I'm good. And how are you? Good. I think everybody's adjusting to the new normal or the abnormal or whatever this is called right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's a strange situation. I think, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of a, in a privileged position to be able to enjoy um, quarantine a bit. I'm able to um, connect with my family. I've got a, a two-year-old, at, or just turned three. I've got a three-year-old at home. And um, and it's actually, a, some. you know, the, the social distancing is sort of distancing yourself from others, but it's allowing for, I think, uh, close connection with with our family um which thankfully has uh not been touched by covid um and then you know i've got i've got the luxury that i told my entire team to work from home and so they all did and that meant the executive office was empty so i can come into the executive <laughs> office and right. and work um right and then you know also we are able to do some work that's directly related to the to the crisis and so i think maybe one of the challenges in the, in a quarantine situation is sort of feeling like you're sitting on your hands and you can't really do anything and right um yeah i'm thankful that uh i've got i've got work that allows me to to try and do something meaningful in in the situation and i think my team feels that way too that's I, I think we have that same conversation in our team office where we're looking at the big picture of, you know, how do we deal with the situation right now? Yeah. Like, then what do we do as we assess and reemerge? So, yeah, I, I understand your comments. Um, let me let me kind of kick this off um, and kind of talk about what we're going to talk about here. Sure. It's really going to spend a few minutes, just maybe even 10 minutes or so. What we want to do is give a quick snapshot of of great conversations that are happening in our community. Mm -hmm. And as you already said, you know, you as a business owner, um, both your backstory and your future story are so intertwined with being able to look at the big picture of any situation and understand the moving parts of a, of a situation and how relationships matter and how relationship connections matter in defining moments. Um, and what I wanted to do was kind of talk about you as a company, give me just, you know, maybe the elevator speech of the mm -hmm. company, maybe even intersperse a little bit of your personal story in that. And then I want to dive a little bit deeper into the COVID conversation because um, you guys have been doing such great work thinking about COVID and how it relates to, to our community. So maybe with that, give me, give me your elevator speech. Tell me about Exaptive. Tell me about you and tell me about the type of work you guys typically did. So, the focus of Exaptive is on using technology and data to try and facilitate innovation. And, um, you know, that sounds like a very um, lofty goal, but if you think about the types of technological platforms that we have in our society today, we have platforms that um, help people find music that they wouldn't have normally found, like, you know, Pandora and Spotify. We have um, platforms that help people uh, catch a cab that they might, you know, normally wait longer for on the street corner to catch a cab. We've got plat dating platforms that help people, um, you know, find compatible partners that they might not normally find. So all of these platforms, we have a lot of platforms in our society today that try and take the serendipity out of certain things that used to ha heavily rely on serendipity. But in the case of innovation, I think we're still in a mode that relies a lot on serendipity. And we still have a belief in the, the sort of myth of the lone genius, that uh, innovations are kind of one smart person having this aha light bulb moment. Um, and, and if we subscribe to that, then there's not a lot we can do to facilitate it because it's just up to that smart person having aha moment. The reality is that's not how innovations happen, that um, ideas are networks of smaller ideas that build together, and that technology is really good at facilitating um, the assembling of larger networks from smaller pieces. And so it's been the mission of Exaptive to build tools and platforms 
that use um, data science, that use um, network-based tools and um, graph-based data. Those are all different terms for kind of network-related technologies. It's been our mission to use those to create tools that stack the odds in favor of those serendipitous aha innovations by connecting people to the right resources and by connecting people to other people that are potential collaborators they might not normally collaborate with. So kind of going down that path, tell us about the cognitive cities idea and the concept. And, you know, to us lay people that aren't in it every day, kind of maybe give us sort of a, a lay people type explanation. And then, and then I want to talk about what it look like to apply that concept in this time and in this space, I, I'm, I'm just really curious to hear how that type of thinking plays out in a moment like the one we're in. Sure. It looks like my video did something weird. Give me one second. I'll unplug this and plug it back in. Sure. There we go. Okay. So um, it's actually a pretty straightforward concept to think about what the cognitive city is. Um, we call it a city because um, innovation tends to come from cities. And our physical cities have been places that generate um, a disproportionately large number of good ideas because of the network effects of the diversity of the people in those cities. And um, that's really key in terms of what makes a city produce new ideas is diversity and friction. And not all friction is bad. Um, there's this concept in cities of productive friction. And Jane Jacobs wrote about this in the, in the Life and Death of Great American Cities about Productive friction, for example, when you're walking on the sidewalk and a sidewalk cafe has its, its seats kind of uh, spilling over into the sidewalk and you have to move out of the way. That's a form of friction, but that's also a form of engagement with the city and interaction. And so cities are designed to have lots of friction and um, some of it's unproductive, uh, traffic jams and waiting, waiting in lines and things like this but some of it is productive. And so the idea behind the cognitive city was to think about what if we used software tools to create a virtual city where we could minimize the unproductive friction and maximize the productive friction. And this is, a, I think, an unusual concept in kind of user environment design, because most of the focus of our web-based technologies has been to remove all friction from the system mm -hmm. so that you can, you can buy something in one click, you can watch you know, the movie you wanna see on Netflix, you can watch it immediately without waiting in line. It's all about removing friction. But when it comes to collaboration and it comes to idea generation, you need to have a certain amount of friction. That's where the good ideas come from. And so the idea of a cognitive city is a virtual environment in which um, people interact like they do in a real city, but it's been tuned to maximize the productive types of interactions and try and minimize the unproductive ones. And I think that you know, COVID is um, a kind of fascinating example where we've in many ways lost the benefits of our physical cities. Uh, now we're in quarantine, we're in social distancing, I'm not able to pull my colleagues together into a conference room or in front of a whiteboard and get them all to you know, sketch their ideas out. I'm not able to use all the physical props that we tend to use um, for ideation and for collaboration. So now it's, it's more important than ever that we have the virtual props that can uh, stimulate the same sort of uh, collaboration. I've, I've seen your, the, the, the city play out live, you know, mm -hmm. about the innovation district, we did that exercise of having the people on the dots connect. And oh, right. it's really neat to see the map play out and 
this idea of creative friction and creative collisions. It's one I think we very much believe in. And as you know, are thinking about in the context of our city and how we generate new ideas or adapt ideas to new needs related to the bumping in of good people with, with good thoughts and good ideas. This has been one of the things I, I, I didn't expect when I moved to Oklahoma City, but I've been completely you know, delighted by is that I, I started, as you know, I started the company in Boston and um, had incubated this idea in Boston. My wife is, is an academic and she had a great opportunity to come teach at the University of Oklahoma. So that's what brought us to, to Oklahoma City. Yeah. And originally, um, I, I was nervous about the move. I'd say my wife was was even more nervous about the move because I was, you know, moving for her, and she was really hoping it would be a, a positive experience for me. Right. Um, at a certain point, after I'd been here for a little while, and I'd started to, I started to see the maps program. Uh, it was, you know, five years ago now, so it's it's actually changed a lot since that time. But even then. There had been a huge investment in the MAPS program. There'd been a rejuvenation of downtown and there'd been a whole set of new MAPS projects that were starting like the streetcar um, and things like that. And I sort of realized that what Oklahoma City was doing um, was trying to create the urban design to promote productive friction and good ideas the same way that I was trying to do the software design that would do that in the virtual domain. And maybe, you know, after we were here for a few months, my wife, you know, wanted to check in and are are you okay on the move? And and I just, uh, we were, we were actually living in uh, Midtown and uh, I just sort of opened the, the screen to the window where we could look out at everything that was happening in Midtown, which was just going, um, develop, being developed like crazy then. And I said to her, I said, look, this is a fantastic place to build a cognitive city because there are actually putting the same ideas into practice in the physical city. So it was, it was a great move and inspiring. And, and now, you know, five years later to start to see the cognitive city um, combine with the physical city and in the innovation district and things like that has been really um, satisfying and and meaningful. Well, I have to tell you too, thank you for helping think through that. That's been a fun to be able to bring technology to the table. No, my pleasure. That's, you know, um, As a technologist, I'm kind of in this situation where in a certain way, we we have this not glamorous position, like we're just tool builders, you know? Um, My team is not going to cure cancer or solve the problems of malnutrition or climate change. Like that's what the subject matter experts are gonna do. But, you know, if we can bring the tools to the table that help the experts make those discoveries or solve those problems a little bit sooner or a little bit differently than they might have um, otherwise, that's the, you know, that's the reward for us. Well, we take that and leap forward to COVID and tell yeah. us just again in a quick snapshot, how you're, how you're using your technology and your team to help evaluate the COVID conversation. So, you know, the thing that became clear right away with COVID is um, that there was a frenzy of activity and um, it needed to be channeled in certain ways. And it was hard to know how to channel all that energy and all that activity if people weren't able to um, know what was being done. And so the way that the COVID-19 Cognitive City started was to create a central repository by which the different efforts related to COVID could be mapped and the different resources related um, to COVID could be mapped. And, and that's because at the very beginning of the, of the crisis, and we, we stood up the COVID um, City one day after the the WHO announced a pandemic. So in in the very early stages, people were just trying to identify, I've got a data set here that might help. I I have a clinical trial that, you know, was related to a drug that might be of interest or was related to COVID, or here's some articles that people might be interested in, or here's a a tracker like the John Hopkins uh, geographical tracker. Here's a tracker that's useful. So there was, there was a flurry of, um, resources being illuminated, but they were still spread out all over 
the web. And so it was still the case that in order for people to access those, they needed to just have all these different bookmarks. And so the first thing we wanted to do is just be able to provide a kind of central card catalog of all the things that were that were going on. Now, that was just a means to an end. Um, we really see the city as adding the most value, not in creating lists. Those lists become hard to manage. So right. the goal was to start to catalog that information so that we could then start to illuminate some meta level structure on top of all those different initiatives. And so, so what happened is the Cognitive City started evolving, just like every city evolves as, um, as people you know, immigrate to it. Right. So the city started to, to evolve to have views that showed not just the resources, but how they were related to each other. So this data set produced this tool, this tool was written about in this article, and that starts to show the way that ideas can feed on each other. Right. And then the next step was to start to show how those um, strings of resources roll up to higher level goals. At, at the end of the day, we don't wanna have a collection of resources about COVID. We wanna have a vaccine, we wanna have a cure, we wanna have clear protocols for how we take care of people who have it. We wanna have communities that know um, what to do in the, in the cases of uh, COVID in their community. And it's not all medically related. We also um, want to have economic uh, thoughts about how we get through the medical crisis without um, trying to minimize the kind of economic crisis. So we built a hubs of activity view around six areas, um, drugs, vaccine, care, diagnostics, community, and economics. And then we started engaging the community to align the resources that they found, they had found into those um, hubs of activity. And this idea for hubs of activity actually came about from somebody who joined the Cognitive City um, reaching out to me um, and, and proposing this, this idea and then my team acting on it. So, so the very idea of hubs of activity was itself um, sparked by the productive friction inside the city as people started to come in. And we're seeing more and more of that start to happen. That's fantastic. So give me a very quick snapshot of who's, who's using, who's participating, how, how wide is the scope of the COVID cognitive city? So we've got, um, you know, it's, the numbers are growing every day right now. I think we're about 2000 um, people in the city. I think to me, what I'm excited about more than the quantity of people, because at internet scale, 2000 is still a pretty small number, but the quality of the participants is very high. We have, um, we have academic institutions uh, like Stanford, like MIT um, that are joining. We have um, organizations like the Gates Foundation who has been a strategic partner in, uh, in the COVID city organizations like the Gates Foundation joining the Research Data Alliance, uh, really strong organizations coming in and people with strong skill sets across the entire spectrum of this crisis. So we have epidemiologists, we have data scientists, we have research scientists, we have clinicians, um, and we have um, economists. And I think that's the real, the real key, along with concerned citizens who um, I think this is an interesting point that, that it's easy for people to think that they don't have the skill sets, the skill set to maybe contribute to this crisis. But the whole point of Exaptive is that it's easy for people to forget how their expertise in one area may be able to translate to help in other areas. So we have these concerned citizens that came in saying, I'm not going to identify with one of these key roles like an epidemiologist, scientist, data scientist, et cetera. I'm just going to be a concerned citizen. Right. But now as ideas are coming out of the city, we're starting to see ways that educators, you know, people with pedagogy and educational experience are important because everyone's figuring out how to homeschool their kids. And what if we created homeschooling lesson plans that achieve some educational objectives, but also helped um, move forward some of the COVID initiatives like K 
cataloging of certain um, tools or research. So, so it's been interesting to see how skills that people maybe in the beginning thought were not critical are now becoming in demand. And again, that's, that's the whole vision of how you facilitate innovation across domains. Tell us, tell us how, um, in this kind of last sort of time we have together, tell us how someone can find out more about the Cognitive City conversation and if there's interested parties, be one of those community participants. I, I think it's, as a city, someone that's engaged in where the city's going, I love these kind of conversations because they so exemplify how when you have a group of really talented people in a space that can collide well together, good things happen. But tell us how someone can participate. If it's yeah, so, so it's, you know, in the past, we've set up cognitive cities for, um, you know, for particular businesses or organizations, they've been closed cities. The COVID-19 city is not a closed city. It is a public city and it is free and it's open to any, everyone and anybody um, who's interested. And so you can just go to covid-19.cognitive.city and, um, and then you can sign up. It takes two minutes to just put in your name, email address. And we do ask a couple questions about um, your, your skill set and, and what we call needs and provide. So the one way you can add value is you can say, here's what I need and here's what I can provide. And then we've created a view that's called the needs provides view where you're able to see people who provide something that you said you needed and you're able to see the people who said they needed something that you provide. And then with a couple clicks in the city, you can um, connect with those people, just like you would do through you know, Facebook or LinkedIn or any social network. But the difference here um, between a cognitive network and a social network is we're not trying to drive the connection around um, being social. We're trying to drive the connection around thinking together and working together on a solution to, to COVID. And so everything that happens in a cognitive network happens um, with particular goals and aims in mind. And if you are trying to figure out how you can help, how you can put your energy into this, you can sign up for the city, you can connect with some other people, you can uh, help us curate the view of who's doing what, and you can record ideas um, that may come out of your conversations with the other people in the community, or you can join projects that other people in the community are already starting based on the things they said that project needs. Um, so please take a few minutes, um, connect, explore, and you can always connect directly with me if you, if you have questions and I'd be happy to um, talk more about it. Give us the URL one more time. So it's covid-19.cognitive.city. Perfect. Well, Dave, thank you so much for what you're doing, for what your team's doing, your investment and stick to here in Oklahoma City, and just for all the things you participate in. I, I, it's a pleasure to talk and a pleasure to hear how you're able to leverage thoughts, ideas, and technology in this moment. Well, thank, thank you for thank everything you're doing, doing, and thank you for uh, helping to get the message out. It's appreciated. Absolutely. So thanks again, and let us know, too, if you have questions on your side. I, I will. Thanks. Look forward to more, more conversation. Me as well. Cheers. Thanks. Have Take a great care. day. You too. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.